What were more depraved than ever in an ancient nation from the book of Genesis is at the helm of all our moral corruption. And this includes everything from the legal system, which affords favoritism to the rich, to the entertainment sector, which glorifies every vice under the sun. And what if the Grecian Empire of old was responsible for renaming nearly every nation so that everyone became lost to their original names with no one left to correct such arrogance? Would not the whole world be in darkness over their true ancestry and heritage? But that isn't even the worst. For what if the same nation at the helm of society today also underwent a name change itself and was prophesied to be cut off by slaughter forever and determined beforehand to be the end of the world? When you wish to know who they were, indeed, who they still are, and avoid them potentially at all costs? Well, that's today's topic. Who is this harbinger of doom? This harbinger known as Esau. Hello, and welcome to First Light's Ancient Illumination. I'm your host, Renaya, and if you're new, make sure you hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell too to place yourself at the forefront of illumination. So go ahead, click it, got it, good. Now on to today's topic, who is Esau? On a surface level, the answer is easy. Genesis chapter 25 verse 24 tells us that Esau was the twin brother of Jacob, aka Israel, according to Genesis chapter 32 verse 28. Furthermore, Genesis chapter 25 exposes a few more details about Esau. Verse 23 tells us Esau would be stronger than his younger brother Jacob. Nonetheless, in the end, Esau would serve Jacob. Verse 25 gives us a physical description of Esau, namely that he was red all over like a hairy garment. And verse 27 tells us that Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. However, it's Esau's lesson in Genesis chapter 27, verse 39 to 40, that takes the cake. Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above, meaning Esau would live in the best locations and in regions high up in the sky. Going further, the text reads, And by thy sword shall thou live. But as mentioned earlier, the Greeks did quite a number on the world through their renaming of people and countries. As recorded by the historian Josephus in chapter 5 of his Antiquities of the Jews, book 1, the Greeks claimed to themselves the glory of antiquity, giving name to the nations that sounded well in Greek that they might be better understood among themselves, and then set agreeable forms of government over them as if they were people derived from themselves. And so, when Obadiah chapter 1, 9 through 10 predicts that Esau would be cut off by slaughter and cut off forever for the violence against his brother, the Grecian renaming of nation confounds the clarity of Josephus, rendering his words useless. This is also the case in 2 Esdras chapter 6, verse 9, which hails Esau as the end of the world. Or is it? For nations are defined by certain traits and characteristics. The Egyptians, because of the pyramids, are identified as mighty architects. The Greeks, as philosophers, with the likes of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and as mighty conquerors as well, under the leadership of Alexander the Greek. And the Romans? Well, they were known, and still are, as the most brutal and tactical military force to ever march the face of the earth. And so when it comes to identifying Esau and his descendants, the Edomites, also known as the Dumian, we should be able to observe some of his traits in them, as the saying goes, like father, like son. But before we venture into this realm of characteristics, let's see if first a few Hebraic writings can shed some light on the mystery that is Esau. And while we ramp up for this, consider this. After the flood, there were only three families remaining on earth as recorded in Genesis chapter 10. They were the families of Japheth, Shem, and Ham. Now the question is, which family do you think you descend from? Make your selection in the poll above and type illumination in the comment section below if you have scriptural proof to affirm your selection. Also, for your convenience, Genesis chapter 10 is listed below as well. And for those of you who like puzzles, stick around to the very end for today's ancient mystery. So let's resolve who is Esau together. In particular, who is Esau today? And what better place to start than with our abbreviated genealogy of Esau 
with the complete listing found in Genesis chapter 36. And starting at verse 8, it reads, Esau is Edom, and these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. Esau's son, Eliphaz, and Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, and she bare Amalek. So here we have the grandson of Esau called Amalek. And like many other forefathers, the nation of people that came from him were named after him, and they were known as the Amalekites, or simply Amalek. And in the passage of time, they became so wicked before the Most High that he commanded Saul, the first king of the nation of Israel, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3, to go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Unfortunately, King Saul disobeyed. Indeed, if it was left up to him, he would have spared the king of the Amalekites, King Hagag. In a way, he did, for he may have very well killed every Amalekite that he saw. But because he was distracted with keeping the best of the best, as indicated in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 9, ultimately, he loved survivors. Yes, King Ahag was later cut down by Samuel the prophet. But Samuel wasn't with Saul during his military campaign, and this becomes abundantly clear in the book of Esther during the time of the media Persian Empire, when one prince was advanced above all other princes. His name was Haman. He was an Agite, according to Esther chapter 3, verse 1. The descendant of the same King Agag that King Saul was supposed to kill. And so Haman was an Edomite, just under a different name. And if you know anything about the book of Esther, Haman wanted to secretly commit genocide upon the Jews, both near and far, under the pretense that they were a national threat. As Esther chapter 3 verse 8 records him saying, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's law, therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. But this intrigue was eventually thwarted by Queen Esther and her uncle Mordecai. To find out how, read the book of Esther. However, we're not done with the book of Esther yet. Why? Because the Apocrypha, which the Roman Catholic Church has taken out of the Bible, contains quite a bit more of Esther than we're led to believe. However, all of it is not of importance right now, because only those portions which pertains to Esau do. And of interest, we find this in Esther chapter 16, verse 10 and 14, that Haman was a Macedonian and a stranger from the Persian blood, who through his intrigue wished to have translated the kingdom of the Persians to the Macedonians. And who were the Macedonians? For the answer, we turn to another book in the Apocrypha, namely 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 1. And it happened, after that Alexander son of Philip the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chittim, had spent Darius king of the Persians and Medes, that he reigned in his stead, the first over Greece. Did you catch that? Alexander the Great, as some call him, was a Macedonian, who had the same game plan as Haman, and indeed was family by blood, Macedonian blood. The only difference was that Alexander succeeded where Haman fell, and thereafter became the first over Greece. Are you seeing it now? Grecian, from Macedonian, from Agite, from Amalekite, from Edomite, from Esau, all the same family controlling all the records along the way. And it goes deeper, for during Alexander the Greek's conquest, many women were raped, spreading their descendants all around the world. So the end of the Grecian Empire by the Romans did not abolish the line of Esau. Rather, the Grecian Edomites used the same tactics as in the media Persian Empire to get ahead under the Romans until they were in seats of power once more. Evidence of this is found in Matthew chapter two. During this passage, the wise men visit the Messiah as an infant, but are warned not to return to Herod, the Edomite client king ruling over Jerusalem under the authority of the Romans. When Herod discovers he has been duped by the wise men, he kills off children two years and younger in an attempt to overthrow a single prophecy that a future king, an anointed one, would save his people. And this is exactly what you would expect from a non-Israelite king, especially from a people of perpetual hatred. And so the annuals of time pass, and the Roman Empire eventually falls, but the Edomites simply regroup, as they have always done in time past. 
As Malachi chapter 1 verse 4 puts it, Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. And so they did. And for a time, the majority of them fled into the Turkish state of Khazar, strengthening this empire for nearly three centuries between 650 and 965 AD until Khazar was destroyed in the 960s. After which, the Khazar Edomites dispersed into southern Russia and into Europe, specifically Poland and Germany, where they intermingled once more. So who is Esau? He is modern Jewry, or as defined by their own writings, namely the 1925 Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume 5, page 41, Edom is in modern Jewry. Same difference though. And there you have it. Esau is posing as his brother Israel, while being spread out so thin genetically that in the purest sense, he is no longer an Edomite. As in the bridge version of Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 10, 15, and 16 puts it, Esau's seed is spoiled, and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. For lo, he is made small among the heathen, and despised among men. His turbulence has deceived him, and the pride of his heart, he that dwells in the cleft of the rock, that holds the height of the hill. And why the clefts of the rock and the height of the hill? Because he hails from the Caucasus Mountains. And what does Caucasian mean? From the Caucasus Mountains, our cave dweller. Which brings us full circle back to the characteristics atomized about Esau from Genesis chapter 25 and 27. That Esau, one, would live off the fatness of the earth from all of his conquests. Two, would be motioned by the dew of heaven from his mountainous habitation. Three, would be a cunning hunter, which has translated not only in his wasteful hunting of animals, but also in his destruction of human life throughout history, like with Alexander the Greek, and his ability to wiggle into positions of authority, like with either Haman or Herod. Four, would live by the sword, which has followed him through the Grecian, Roman, and Khazar empires and even recently in the conquest of America. As one report from globalresearch.ca puts it, America has been at war 93% of the time since 1776 until 2015, and that percentage continues to grow. So now you know who is Esau and what his mannerisms are and what lengths he has taken to deceive the whole world, even his own people, and all for a bloody kingdom that always was and always will be doomed to fail. So beware of Edomites who are unrepentant, who hate without a cause, for such people will surely bring forth the end of the world. Anyway, may this knowledge be a blessing to you, and if this message has proven faithful to the word, then give us a thumbs up, and definitely share this ancient illumination with other seekers of truth, seekers like you. Shalom. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Seek, observe, understand.